Cuando dejas tus activos digitales en un exchange o en custodia de alguien más, te expones a riesgos de terceros no deseados. A diferencia del sistema bancario tradicional, Bitcoin te permite tomar el control total de tus fondos utilizando tus propias claves privadas. Esto te permite ser soberano y esencialmente tu propio banco. Al tomar el control de tus Bitcoins, puedes evitar riesgos innecesarios de terceros. Almacenar tus Bitcoins en custodia de terceros como los exchanges puede exponerte a ataques de actores malintencionados, gobiernos o estafadores que lo único que quieren es apoderarse de tu dinero. El proceso de autocustodia puede parecer abrumador al principio, pero afortunadamente Blockstream Jade Wallet hace que sea súper fácil custodiar tus activos. Las billeteras de hardware son dispositivos que almacenan de forma segura las claves privadas de tus bitcoins y activos de Liquid sin conexión a internet. Las billeteras de hardware aumentan la seguridad de tu billetera porque tus claves privadas se almacenan en un dispositivo especializado que no está siempre conectado al internet. Como te he dicho antes, mantener tus claves almacenadas en un dispositivo en línea puede exponerte a factores adicionales de ataque, por lo que se recomienda usar una billetera de hardware al almacenar grandes cantidades de Bitcoin durante largos periodos de tiempo. Jade es una billetera de hardware no custodial para Bitcoins y Liquid que ofrece opciones de firma simple y firmas múltiples. Yo personalmente lo utilizo para almacenar mis Bitcoins, ya que me siento mucho más seguro manteniendo es mis Bitcoins en una billetera fría que en una almacenada, por ejemplo, en mi teléfono. Si estás pensando en adquirir uno para ti, no olvides utilizar el código de descuento de, descuento de nuestro show, BitCorner Podcast. De esta forma estarás apoyando directamente el show y además obtendrás un 10% de descuento para la compra de tu billetera fría. Educating about Bitcoin is not about learning the hard skill or soft skill. It's more about changing the belief system. Because mm -hmm. Bitcoin is so big and so philosophical and deep once you get into it. It's yeah. really changing how we are thought about money, how we were, what we thought about money, what we believed about money. And that's the hardest one. Like changing belief system, it's like that's the toughest one. So yeah. we as Bitcoin educators, we need to be even more careful about communication and be very recipient, be very patient. And this is actually what we in MTH uh, want to teach, train the trainers or educate the educators academies uh, to, to have better Bitcoin educators and more of them around the world so they can become the lighthouses of, of, of hope for their local communities. <music> Hello guys, welcome once again to Bitcoiner Podcast. Uh, today it's a really good episode. Uh, actually, I'm going to interview a neighbor from El Salvador. <laughs> he is right now doing a good project uh, called AmityH. So by that name, you probably know who I'm talking about. So uh, without further ado, I just want to welcome to do something. So welcome to the show, man. <laughs> Hello, hello, Juan. Good to good to be here. Big pleasure. <laughs> yeah, finally, it's so good to, to meet you. Uh, how's the weather in Honduras? I see that it's super sunny, man. <laughs> yeah, right now it's beautiful, but it yesterday was almost like a crazy storm. Things flying around, big winds, rain everywhere. So it's changing all the time. Right now it's a rainy season here in Roatan, so mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very very changing every day. So we're looking forward for a good season starting from January, February, later on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know it's a wild weather uh, right now here yeah. in Europe. Well, I'm a bit cold, so, <laughs> so I, I kind of envy <laughs> I you. I'm a not... jacket. Yeah, <laughs> but it's fine. So yeah, is this is it just winter? So it's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I'm coming back to Slovakia um, in like seven, eight days. And oh, uh, when shoot. I go with, yeah, mm -hmm. when I go with my girlfriend, uh, she's like with a hat, you know, with a jacket. I'm like, damn, I don't want to go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here absolutely. I'm just having flip flops and and beach shorts, and that's it. That's that's what you need here. Yeah, sometimes when I well, I almost call my parents every single day, and sometimes it's raining, but. They are in shorts and I'm like, are you not calling? They are, no, it's just raining, but the, the weather is super fine. I was like, what? <laughs> okay, okay. <Yeah. laughs> you cannot say that here because exactly. in, the, in, in the first second that it started to rain, you feel cold. 
because the the temperature yeah dropped. yeah <laughs> yeah i know that feeling brother i know that feeling coming back to europe and uh, <laughs> i wouldn't have a girlfriend there you know i need to i need to bring her here <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely but uh in the end it's the most wonderful time of the year so i at, at least oh, for me i love sorry. winter <laughs> yeah yeah so, i like it a lot like as well yeah absolutely absolutely uh no i was going to tell you that uh so as as usual on the podcast uh could you please introduce yourself for the people that don't know you and tell your story about your upbringing <laughs> yeah so uh i'm dusan i'm a bitcoin educator from slovakia i was I'm, I, i have been doing bitcoin education for about six seven years right now so um my background is is in teaching i was a math mm -hmm. physics and english tutor for some years i was teaching kids from six years old all the way to university students um and and that's that was when i fell in love with education and seeing this kind of changing the approach to education for a kid and and kids going from the worst grades in math all the way to the best ones for me that was like a big game change how the kids uh regain confidence in themselves how parents started to treat the, their kids better if they saw like wow that my kid is doing great so that's when i really fell in love with education and when i uh went down the bitcoin rabbit hole and started exploring that i was like okay this is what i want to teach we lack financial literacy or monetary literacy in the world and this is where i can help and where i have the passion so i was doing a lot of podcasts webinars workshops uh translated some books about bitcoin into slovak language um i was training teachers how to teach bitcoin in schools as well and um and then we wanted to scale it up uh, because i was kind of one man show doing consultancy consultancies mm -hmm. and i was like okay this is not very scalable because i was doing consultations seven days uh, seven hours a day and i was like getting burned out to kind of do the same thing all over so i was mm -hmm. like okay i need to scale it up i want to educate 100 million people about bitcoin why 100 million because i want to educate the same amount of people as there are satoshis in one bitcoin that was kind of the the idea behind it um so i cannot do it myself i want to scale it up but the education is very hard to scale very hard to finance you depend on grants you depend on donations so we decided that we would like to self-sustain it ourselves and create a business that can sustain the education activities and that's when we start to do bitcoin mining so three years ago uh we set up a first bitcoin mining uh, container in slovakia we filled it up pretty quick with uh, machines of my clients so we had after a month of starting it up we had maybe yes 160 s19s at a time so almost like one and a half million dollars uh, in investment there mm -hmm. then we opened up a new container so we fill up that one so we had two full containers of machines and um and then we we needed to move out from europe because the prices went up the war came in so we needed to figure out a place where we can continuously mine and that's where we ended up in paraguay where we do a mining hosting um next to the largest power plant uh like third largest power plant in the world itaipu whole paraguay is is water based so uh, uh the whole consumption 100% of that is hydroelectricity mm -hmm. and the paraguay is the largest electricity exporter in the world as well and that's why it's very good place to be doing bitcoin mining and that's where we we set up so right now we can scale the education activities we set up bitcoin academy here in honduras on the rotan island where there's a bitcoin jurisdiction so we can talk about all of that it's uh, yeah. i don't want to kind of like ramp up <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but questions. no okay okay no that, that that's perfect man uh i didn't know about that that about paraguay actually i was wondering well, yeah why 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 paraguay you know, but now, now i get it it's interesting oh yeah it's it's like a mecca for miners it's it's a great place it's the second safest country in southern america after uruguay um again it's a huge electricity producer they're selling 40 percent of electricity they produce to brazil and argentina mm. so uh it's one of the best places cheap electricity abundant electricity green electricity so it's uh it's really really good there okay okay and what what inspired you to take this path and uh, i mean and how do you and how do you uh how do you start your bitcoin rabbit hole journey 
Wow. So um, it was 2017 when I when I started, and uh, <clears throat> and it was yeah. So basically, um, one of my friends he wanted to uh, we wanted to to have a website for our company. I had a business before a construction company we were building outdoor workout parks and we want to have a website i met with him and he told me you know dusan right now i'm doing more bitcoin than websites i'm like peach what the heck like this <laughs> multi-level ponzi scheme got you as well like oh my god i was very skeptical mm -hmm. and first i heard about bitcoin 2015 but i didn't care and then 2017 i was like okay peter i trust you tell me about it like why are you in it like what's interested there and we were chatting about um, why or and how Bitcoin can help in countries where the money is failing, when the economy is, is falling apart. We didn't talk a lot about like, okay, let's make money on Bitcoin and you can trade and all of that stuff. That, that doesn't uh, interest me that much. But the, the economic and social aspect of Bitcoin was for me like a game-changing thing. And that's, that evening, I sat down and I was like five hours straight studying Bitcoin, anything I can find. I can find oh. I went to sleep like almost in the morning and uh, I told my my friends, my colleagues, like the next day I'm not going to work because I'm going to study Bitcoin. <laughs> They're like, what the heck? <laughs> so I took awesome. some time to really get in. And um, and no, I started to fall down that the rabbit hole. And after a couple of months, I did my first, um, first uh, workshop on Bitcoin. And also what I was doing, like... I had uh, open consultations in a cafeteria where I was sitting every day from three to five. Anybody can come. We can talk about Bitcoin for free. And every time oh, they wow. gave me a question uh, that I didn't know, I was like, okay, man, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to research it and I'm going to answer it. So in this way, I learned much, much more about Bitcoin that I could, so that I can explain it better. So this helped me as well a lot in my education journey as well. That's so cool. That's amazing. Yeah, actually, this is this is a good strategy to to learn more, right? When you know don't know anything, you, you write it down and then you do your own research. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Totally. And, totally. Uh, and I have a question. Now that you say that people come to talk to you uh, and just spend hours talking about Bitcoin, you know, holidays are coming, so you know the the dinner, the family dinners are coming as well. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> So one of my question is for any Bitcoiner that, you know, want to orange pill uh, family members or friends, uh, what advice do you, do you give to them or how do you start orange pill your, your family members? <laughs> well, initially I wanted to tell anybody, everybody about Bitcoin and wanted to kind of like shove it to everybody's throat. And <laughs> soon you realize like people are don't want to talk with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so my fr my friends start to be like, oh man, just stop that Bitcoin shit. So right now I'm more like, uh, like people can approach me if they want to, of course, uh, or they book consultation with me. But for like the family dinners, um, I was doing right now in El Salvador and also in Lugano a workshop for Bitcoin educators uh, mm -hmm. that was called Handling Objections. And this workshop is designed for people who want to educate Bitcoin but they are maybe many like they are very keen on like just argumenting like why bitcoin is better why it's amazing and so on and they forgot to listen to the other party so this um what i was teaching to educators and then this applies actually to 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 things outside of bitcoin as well this applies to having relationships um family dinners you know it's basically a communication skill so i was teaching yeah. people like argumentation shouldn't be the first response that we are we are providing to another party. So imagine you start to talk about Bitcoin and people start to object and they're going to say, well, I don't think it's going to work. I think the government will stop it. I think it's only used by uh, criminals. Um, I think it's going to burn our planet or whatever, whatever yeah. um, argument. Many times the, the educators or any Bitcoiner responds like, oh, that's not true. And let me tell you why. And they start to shove the arguments. But if you think about it, when somebody is objecting, the person is basically speaking from like reptilian brain, from amygdala. They are afraid. They You hit them with some information that contradicts their belief system. So they start to tell you uh, and they start to kind of protect themselves and their belief system with, with an argument, with an objection. 
And if you want to speak with, to them from your neocortex with logic and argument, it will not work because they're in emotion. Mm -hmm. they, some, something got them triggered. So what you need to do, firstly, you need to understand what's the fear behind their objection? What, how do they feel at that moment? If somebody is objecting to environmental problems, probably that person is very concerned with, uh, with planet Earth, you know, warming up or environment being destroyed. And he didn't have the data so far to understand that Bitcoin is not doing that. No. But if you start to shove the data, it will not work. So first of all, you need to um, accept the argument, the, the, the objection. And accept doesn't mean to agree with the argument. Accept means that just to acknowledge that the person is sane for saying that. Because maybe when you were learning about Bitcoin, maybe you had the same objection as well. So what you mm -hmm. can say, like the first step to really in communication is to clarify and understand the objection. So you can ask the person like, okay, so do you mean that um, Bitcoin will not work because uh, the government will stop it? Or do you mean Bitcoin will not work because people will not care about that? So first you need to clarify what the person is really saying and objecting to. Because otherwise you start to argument to something completely different mm -hmm. than the, what the person really wanted to say. So, and once you understand as the first steps, clarification and understanding of the objection, the second step is accepting it and maybe saying, well, I had it the same way when I was learning about Bitcoin. And this way you show the person like they're not stupid for saying that. They are they are sane and they have some some uh, fears in themselves. And many other people have the same thing because person objecting might be in a fear of like, I'm the only one stupid one that thinks that. And many people, many Bitcoiners make them look stupid, like, oh man, you don't know what you're talking about and so on. So the person shuts down and they don't they don't talk to you anymore. Like hearing objections is very positive because that means the person cares. The person cares about what you're saying and they are willing to go into discussion with you. And this way you know what the person is objecting to, where they stop, what they need to get said, clarified. And you can go through the objection with them and help them understand. So you kind of ease down the amygdala so that the neocortex can speak to the neocortex. And that's where the argument is only the third step in the whole process. That's so interesting. I, I never thought about it. And it's, it's so right. That, that, that's why you're a kid, man. <laughs> you know how the brain works. <laughs> you know how the brain works. Ah, that's... Yeah, that's, it's, uh, it's that, a good that's process. very important. And, and again, and this is something that applies to anything. It doesn't only apply to Bitcoin. It applies mm -hmm. to communication in relationships. Like, I'm with my yeah. girlfriend for four years. We never had an argument. Never in four years. Why? Because we really, once we some things starts to come up, we really talk to each other and listen to each other mm -hmm. without kind of important. because many, many pairs, many couples I see just, you know, shouting their own arguments to each other, not listening to the other side. We try to clarify everything. We try to really understand what the person thinks and feels. And we somehow understand like, wow, like we're on the same page without going into like shouting and stuff. Because when people start to shout already, that's mostly, it's not aggression. It's mostly not being understood it's most like frustration that build mm -hmm. up of like that person is not listening to me so i start to raise my voice maybe this this louder volume will go through the barrier of understanding of the, the other person that's how the arguments mostly come up so uh if you really take patience and 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 again it's not intuitive you need to consciously think about it and consciously think what the other person thinks and clarify but then there is no place for arguments. There's only place for discussion, understanding and, and regular talk without the need to raise a voice in, in most of the cases, right? So we have very, very open our relationship with my girlfriend uh, to talk about everything, but we never needed to have a, like a regular argument how people imagine that. Yeah, that's 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 so true, and and I'm glad that that that, that it's so healthy. And actually, you're so right because you know I have a nephew, and uh, right now he is about to be, to be four years old. But he, when he was younger, <laughs> like if he's older, <laughs> but when he was younger, and you know there there's a um, the first three years is really it's it, I heard that it was like super complicated for them because they. They cannot speak, so it's really difficult to them to actually let know the the adult person what exactly they want. So mm -hmm. and and I and I heard that also that that behavior that 
kids usually start screaming or, or yelling or, what, or whatever, but just because they are not, they are misunderstood. And uh, the parents, they feel that the parents don't get exactly the message, something that's super simple. Like, I want water, but they cannot, they cannot say like, I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty, you know? So, and, and I, I learned about, about those things, thanks to my nephew and how to exactly communicate with them. And little by little, by the months uh, has passed, uh, he of course can speak uh, better, but in, in those uh, previous years, we're like, okay, what is it he wants? So yeah, you have to be like very careful and, and to make them understand that you're listening, that you're trying to understand uh, what they want, right? So it, it's super mm-hmm. it's super interesting how the brain, how the, the human behavior works, right? It's it's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> totally, <laughs> it's, totally agree. So that's a, that's a very important part of any education or Bitcoin education as well, because Educating about Bitcoin is not about learning the hard skill or soft skill. It's more about changing the belief system. Because mm-hmm. Bitcoin is so big and so philosophical and deep once you get into it. It's yeah. really changing how we are thought about money, how we were, what we thought about money, what we believed about money. And that's the hardest one. Like changing belief system, it's like that's the toughest one. So yeah. we as Bitcoin educators, we need to be even more careful about communication and be very recipient be very patient and this is actually what we in MTH uh, want to teach train the trainers or educate the educators academies uh, to, to have better Bitcoin educators and more of them around the world so they can become the lighthouses of, of, of hope for their local communities how do you came with with the idea with MTH and well th- let's talk about that and uh, what kind of educational initiatives do you have and activities are uh, you know mm-hmm. undertaken? Order. and tell us so what is right now, also <laughs> yeah uh, so let's start with uh, with, with a name for it okay. so why mth why this weird name that doesn't <laughs> resemble bitcoin at all <laughs> and we wanted initially wanted to have a company that uh because in a lot of conferences where you go you see this bit something coin something all the companies have bit coin or block in it so it's yeah. like you don't even remember so we wanted something like an Apple, because if somebody tells you Apple and you don't know what they're doing, you have no idea that they're doing computers, right? It's so random. Yeah. So that was also one idea. And when we were speaking with my business partner, Gabriel, what really Bitcoin means to us, uh, we came into a c- conclusion that we see Bitcoin as a technology that can really bring people together on a global scale. If we have a sound money, on the global level, people can cooperate better, people can communicate better, there can be more harmony, because if governments doesn't have power over money, they can go to war just, you know, printing money. So we have more peace, more harmony, more friendship, more fellowship around the world. That's what Bitcoin can bring, ultimately. And amity, in English, it's a very archaic word, not used today very much. That means friendship, fellowship, harmony, and peace. It comes from Latin Mm -hmm. and we see Bitcoin as a technology that can bring this era, this age of amity. So that's why we named the company Amity Age. Bitcoin bring the age of amity, Mm -hmm. age of cooperation and friendship. And and then we wanted to create um, a character that will be leading people on this journey. So we we, we did some, some playful thing and we created Amity Nakamoto the granddaughter of Satoshi. Uh-huh. So the young uh, girl, the Japanese looking girl that we have in our logo, she is Amity Nakamoto, the granddaughter of Satoshi, and she is the young blood bringing this age of Amity, bringing this change, helping Bitcoin to scale since her grandfather already left. You know, she's the one to do the work right now. So that's she's so cool. the one leading people on this education journey. Uh, that's always and, and and how is she doing the education journey in Roatan? <laughs> <laughs> she's she, she's doing good. She's she's uh, <laughs> turning one year tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna have a wow. one year anniversary of, of Congra- MIT congratulations. Academy. Thank you. Like, okay, MIT is already three years old. Uh, okay. We set up the company about three years ago, but the MIT uh, MIT Edge Academy, the Bitcoin Center on Roatan, it's gonna be one year tomorrow. We have an anniversary party. And um, what we do, we're teaching kids right now, actually, I came to this podcast immediately after a Bitcoin diploma class that I'm doing here 
on the Rafan. Uh, so this is the fourth graduation that we're gonna do. Fourth, wow. um Turnos of of uh, of kids. Yeah. So we do that. We, we teach Bitcoin diploma, developed in El Salvador. Um, we do our own curriculums as well. You know, doing self custody workshops, lightning workshops, uh, Bitcoin meetups. Uh, people can come to our Bitcoin Academy basically any time and uh, if, if we are there you know we can sit with them set up wallets explain basics we have bitcoin atm people can buy and sell bitcoin uh in mm -hmm. our academy uh we are running our own node showing people what it is how it works running our own btc pay server pos um having a library Actually, right now we're gonna have a pretty cool thing i don't know if you heard about chain duel you mm -hmm. know that game chain uh, duel? no it doesn't sound to me what is it? It was in adopting Bitcoin or also in Lugano. It's a it's a game that's based on the iconic snake game, you know, when, when you when you have two snakes competing to each other, like growing mm -hmm. larger, you know, your uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. game. Mm -hmm. And it's it's based on sets as well. So you you need to uh, top up with sets. You decide, for example, ten thousand sets is the minimum. So both players uh drop in sets, they compete and whoever wins can redeem over L and URL, can redeem uh, the sets back. And you can have but a that's tournament. So cool. Oh man, check it, check it out. Like Francis and, and Pablo, they are the founders of that. You, you type on Twitch or chain dwell and okay. the game is amazing. So we're going to have it here on the anniversary and hopefully people coming to, to the academy can play it as well every day. Uh, because this way games bring people together. And with this one, when people want to play, they can set up a wallet because the only way, only way you can play is really with Satoshi's. And, uh, and there is like this monetary component out of it where you, your uh you know uh there's some adrenaline so i won a tournament in in adopting mm -hmm. bitcoin which was very unexpected i was uh, again is roxy is a mm -hmm. french bitcoin educator he is really great in this game and i really luckily surprisingly won wow. so the the top up the top up was uh the, the buy-in was fifty thousand sets which is like eighteen dollars and uh and i managed to win like 270 dollars in the end wow Wow, that's yeah, so cool. Pretty, yeah, seven hundred sixty thousand sets was the was the price. Wow, I want to play that game. Pretty sick. <laughs> pretty sick. Yeah, I totally I'll definitely check it out. Uh, I gotta check yeah, it out. Yeah, check it out. Chain duel. I I love that. I'm I'm big fan. Big fan. That's that's so cool. So we're gonna have that thing. Uh -huh. No, and and yeah, so we do. We already educated about two hundred uh, two thousand five hundred people here in Honduras, Roatan, and mainland. We mm -hmm. set up uh, about 60 businesses into Bitcoin and uh, and already are accepting here on the island. You know, you can have a tattoo for Bitcoin, coffee, drinks, rent a car, rent a house. And we're that's still cool. working on having a, a gas station and a, and a groceries. That's that's the big thing because the big chains, it's very hard to onboard them, you know. Absolutely. Tell, tell me about it. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I'm so glad that, you know, that, that you're doing that and uh, other countries besides the Salvador are doing it. I know that Mexico also doing it, some efforts. And now that I hear about uh, Honduras as well with METH, it, it's amazing. That's the, how we do little by little, step by step, but the education, it's, uh, it never stops. So that's amazing. Talking about games, yeah. uh, do you know that I have a trivia? So let's do the trivia. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> People know how, how it works, I already explained to you, so there are three questions, uh, one about general culture, one about Salvador, and one about Bitcoin. So the first question is about, uh, it says, uh, I'm going to give you the question and four options. That's how it works. Okay. Okay. So what is the main function as, what? It would, yeah, ask, I, ask. I would like, well, let, let's try without options, maybe. Hopefully I can make it without options. Let's see. <laughs> okay, okay, but uh, give some space for the audience, like three seconds, <laughs> so they can okay, guess. Okay, okay, got it. Okay, so what is the main function of a node in the Bitcoin network? Okay. You can answer. <laughs> I can say, okay. Yeah, so the main function of a node is to verify transactions, to make sure that transaction is not uh, pushed further without it being correct. Um, so, and, and also nodes how to decentralize the network, the modes, the, the more nodes we have, the more robust the network is.
Yeah, absolutely. That's right. <laughs> uh, question number two. Okay, let's see how how well you know your neighbors. <laughs> okay, which monument in San Salvador is considered a national symbol uh, and depicts Christ on a globe mounted on a pedestal? So what is the name of the monument? Yeah. Uh, is it El Salvador del Mundo? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> wow, amazing! <Yes>. Man. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, and actually, right now I'm... they have made some changes. So it's quite super good, super well. Okay, yeah. okay, interesting. Yeah, yes, I, I I haven't been there. I haven't been there uh, because whenever I go to Salvador, I just just for the conference, very quick trip. So uh, hopefully next year I will have more times to to go and enjoy the volcanoes, cupusas, and and all of all of the beauties. Yeah, you should, you should. It, it's amazing. There are some good changes right now. <laughs> okay. Excellent. And the last question uh, is about general culture. And is uh, which city which city is known as the city of skyscrapers and is famous for the Statue of, the Statue of Liberty? Of course, New York. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> three out of three. <laughs> Three out of I three. was I was thinking like it's a city in El Salvador. I'm like in El Salvador. Where are the Statue of Liberty and, and uh, <laughs> skyscrapers? And I'm like, okay, it's global. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm going to I'm going to to shout out uh, Max Kaiser because he was doing uh, in the adopting the kind of comparison with the Statue of Liberty because uh, it just happened that we had the uh, Miss Universe and uh, Isabella that is representing us. Uh, she made this uh, appearance with a volcano that it's uh, oh yeah garden. yeah and Max Keiser said that the next Statue of Liberty symbol will be volcanoes and actually she made that so now now is the new Statue of Liberty in El Salvador. <laughs> it was it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. I, I saw the picture today in the morning and the dress was pretty sick. I know last year there was yeah. like the, the Bitcoin dress. Yeah. Or, or yeah. I think yeah, yeah. last year. Yeah, and this one with the with the volcano that's like whoa that's that's crazy <laughs> yeah that was amazing man that's amazing. wow three out of three the the only person that got three out of three in, in the show was jeff Booth. so you are in tie with jeff Booth. Woo! nice yeah okay, okay. excellent excellent <laughs> in the end at the end of the season we're going to do uh this table with all the points guys and we will see who wins <laughs> yeah nice <laughs> and for ones that are the ones that are tied, maybe we could do a quick game <laughs> in the end. <laughs> so you probably will do it with Jeff Wood. <laughs> nice. Or we do the chain duel together. Uh, ah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Th that would be a good way to to break the tie. <laughs> Actually, I was speaking yesterday with the, with the guys because they are helping me to set it up here, mm -hmm. and they was like, okay, their vision or like one of the things they want to do, like arbitration with the chain duel. So if you have like a case that you want to decide like okay you're gonna play in chain duel and whoever wins receive the sets and like the the, the deal is, is is decided you know <laughs> so that would be pretty cool that's awesome that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> okay going back with amity your goal of educating 100 million people that's a lot <laughs> and it's super impressive you want to do that by 2030 2030 <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, what do you consider that are, are the main challenges? Challenges that have you counter or that you think you will find doing this mission? Because it's it's quite important. Eh? Yeah, I mean, um, I kind of rely on exponential function. So hopefully, the the first like the first years will be slow, and the, the last one should be fast. Hopefully, <laughs> um, what I see as a, as the main component of this is that we don't want to do it alone. We want to have like there's already amazing number of Bitcoin education resources that we use in our day to day classes. So just reinventing the wheel doesn't make sense, I think. Mm -hmm. And what we want to focus on, as I said, is more the educate the educators thing. And this is something that nobody is doing yet. We're building a curriculum around it, and uh, already next year in January, I should have a uh, like a pilot versions of this academy in Salvador for two days and also in Paraguay for two days. 
And then later on, we want to uh, maybe by the time we want to start the online version as well, like an online course. So basically, the handling of the objection will be one part of the online course, right? And later, maybe in April, we will see, we want to do the first kind of very intense educators academy here in the Rantan, and it will be for five to seven days, very deep, very robust, a lot of feedback, a lot of public speaking, um, networking building, like it, it will be very, very intense. Mm -hmm. And this way we want to kind of get more educators, as I said, um, on board. Each participant, we want to have them from a different country. So in this way, if we help more educators to get on their track and educate their local communities, that's where I believe like we can together get to this number. Um, and we develop like a, a interesting um, system of how people can track how many people they educated or like welcome because it's also um, hard to track because what does it mean if a person is educated about Bitcoin? There's no end. Like the rabbit hole continues. Yeah. So we want the goal for us. We reframe the vision a little bit, and the goal for us is to welcome hundred million people in the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Because if you welcome a person in the rabbit hole and they can explore later on, we all of all of us are already in the rabbit hole. So we can welcome them from from the inside, like guys, come in, it's nice here. We can take you by hand and walk you through the rabbit hole. Yeah. Um but and it's never ending. We're still exploring, we're still going deeper and deeper. Um but just giving the person the spark to learn about Bitcoin, then they can then they can find their own resources, whatever they, they like. Is it podcast? Is it video? Is it a book or, a, or an article? Because mm. we're, even me, I, I cannot consider myself like fully educated about Bitcoin. There's still something that I find is new for me. So having 100 million people educated about Bitcoin, I don't think it's possible and it's even measurable. But welcoming 100 million people in the Bitcoin rabbit hole, that's something measurable because somebody can say if the person if, if he himself is already in the rabbit hole or not yet if you're already reading everything you can you can consider yourself in the rabbit hole and this yeah. is much easier to measure to distinguish and uh so this is kind of what we reframed a little bit for us so that should be a little bit easier to measure and uh and to do it in a way that educators that went through our program can can track it in a way and somehow we can we can get to a number hopefully by 2030 we will see hopefully yeah man that that's uh i love uh big challenges and this is a good challenge so hopefully uh you will get it i'm, I'm sure that you will get it so so yeah man congratulations and uh thank you yeah i i want to see i want to see that in six years yeah man <laughs> it's, it's so it's just around the corner damn it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it will be it will be i know that the the years will pass fast but in the meanwhile you will have time to, to do so 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 yeah yeah another sure. another <laughs> another thing that i want to ask you now is that you know you have been uh like me in both places in latin america and in, in europe so maybe you have a, a bigger perspective uh about uh you know maybe to perceive the difference in uh in the bitcoin adoption relations so what have you noticed mm -hmm. uh the, the difference in both regions um i think the biggest difference is that in europe people are asking why bitcoin why to have that they just perceive it as another payment rail um they don't see all the benefits that it brings in countries where we don't have um but not people many if a bank account or there's not so many branches of the banks in slovakia there are so many banks they give you cards and accounts and and it's easy to do banking right so you have sepa you have like zero fees in europe uh, for transferring money so people are like well bitcoin maybe for speculation maybe like a diversification of my investment portfolio mm -hmm. but once you go to honduras or central america or salvador uh you start to realize, okay, the Bitcoin is serving a different purpose. It's really doing its thing. It's saving countries where the economy is failing. It's saving fees for remittances, for paying regular stuff. People don't need to travel 
two hours somewhere to pay something in cash. And this is what motivates me. I, I would really love to mostly help in countries where there are high inflation rates, where the economy is not doing well, because I believe that there are these are the places where the Bitcoin as a tool serves the most. Yeah. And uh, and this is the biggest difference that I see. You know, people here are asking not why, but how. They look into Salvador, they see that it works, they see that people are talking about it, using it. And people in Honduras here, they're very excited about Bitcoin. And, like, they want to learn more. Some of them got scammed before because there used to be some crypto scams, some Ponzi schemes. So some of them are already very careful and not trusting, which I respect, you know, that. The level of financial literacy world, worldwide is, is very low. So once somebody falls into some scam, they think that that's all Bitcoin, right? Yeah. So it's kind of hard to um, get the person on board again. But the others who haven't been scammed, they're like, Sam, yeah, I want to learn about it. Like, tell me, where can I come? What can I do? Where can I learn? Where can I buy it? And uh, and yeah, so, uh, so th this would be the main difference that I observed. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's interesting because I think that uh, you know in the in the global south we have the bas basically some common uh, challenges in, in economy like hyperinflation uh, yeah. corruption in terms of politics. But Salvador not right now is in the process of cleaning all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think. Uh, I, I I don't know. It's like we we have some things common, and yeah, I have perceived also uh that here in europe uh, actually the kind of the same perception because when when my friends uh they're europeans uh, we talk about bitcoin but they tell me like how to invest in that and, and i feel like michael sailor when he started like <laughs> you do this <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> like a star over yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah i know i know what you mean i know what you mean <laughs> Yeah, and you know, right now I'm teaching kids here in Rajasthan, and on the first class, you know, I was asking them. We, are, we did a round of introduction, and I asked them, you know, what what they would like to get from these lessons, like what's something about Bitcoin or money they would like to learn. Some mm -hmm. of them said like they would like to learn how to save money, which I was like, excellent, that's amazing to hear. Yeah, but a lot of said like they, they want to learn how to how to you know make money on Bitcoin, how to get rich on it. Mm -hmm. I'm like. <laughs> yeah, absolutely the, the same re reaction and um so no but over time like over the classes as we go through they understand like bitcoin is not the way how to get rich quick it's way how to not get poor slowly and they are getting it they are getting it and uh, um but they need time to really grasp it because from mass media you only get these like crypto bros earning money uh, yeah. That's what they see on TikToks. That's what they see on on Instagrams. So it's it's hard to kind of compete with it uh, when you want to install to them low time preference. Yeah, and they are every day they are basically bombarded with high time preference shit on TikToks, mm -hmm. on Instagrams. Um, you know, so in a one in a one or two hours a day, um, it's very hard to compete with eight hours or their of their life of their kind of upbringing and, and their habits. So, you know, it's, this is a tough one. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I, I hope that by um, seeing the changes in, in El Salvador, by, you know, people uh, know what they see on, on TV or whatever, but uh, that actually Salvadorians that maybe go to travel to Honduras and because people always ask, like, how is the country? And uh, they share the experience. So maybe in that way, they, they can perceive that, that the things have changed and in, in some, places, some places that Bitcoin is already established. Um, mm -hmm. it, it have changed the the lifestyle of have uh, given you know the opportunity to uh, to people that you know like people that sail in the in the streets that they have their their small businesses that before they they couldn't afford to to grow their business or just to save right because they didn't have the right tool mm -hmm. they, they were. They didn't have the bank services, and now with Bitcoin, you have the the bank services without the bank. Yeah. That's that's amazing, and hopefully, uh, that's profound. Yeah, hopefully that they can see that in 
in Honduras. And I, also, I wanted to ask you about that. That uh, I, don't, I don't know how much uh, have you heard in terms of the policymakers. Uh, they want to are they interested at least uh, of what El Salvador is doing? They want to implement it, or have you heard nothing? Or a 50 50? Well, I heard. <laughs> I heard a couple of things that are kind of contradicting. First of all, what is kind of true and the facts underline it is that uh, current government in Honduras is leaning left, is socialist oriented. They okay. start to have friendships with China. Uh, they they do this kind of weird stuff. They're very against um, capitalism. So the, the, the place where we are in Prospera, this is the special jurisdiction of the Roatan. That's why we actually started here. Mm -hmm. Because there is a special jurisdiction which has Bitcoin as the as a yeah. uh, legal tender. You can pay your taxes in Bitcoin. Your Bitcoin is, is not taxed on capital gains. And the whole jurisdiction is basically like a private city. So you are treated as mm -hmm. the customer. And that's how I think the government or like the, the city state should treat you. Because you come there, you work, you pay taxes. You should be treated as a customer, and uh, so and it's very capitalist oriented. It's very pro freedom, pro private property. But the Honduran government is not very friendly with Prospera, although constitutionally Prospera has fifty years of freedom from the government uh, because it's constitutionally correct and everything is is uh, legal. But they don't like the socialists. They don't like somebody showing. Uh, to people that it can work much more efficiently for a lower cost uh, without corruption and so this is what's happening here mm -hmm. and so that's that's one side of the story the other side of the story what i heard about it i don't know i didn't verify it i don't know if it's true i heard at xiaomara which is the, the president here uh she was kind of she's looking up to bukele on the whole bitcoin thing and there were some um some articles already or some some words out there that she might adopt bitcoin as well but as far as i see you know and the all uh, the whole left-leaning system i don't i don't feel that um they would like to do bitcoin because it gives more people it gives more power to people which basically yeah. is against the whole narrative of socialism so uh i'm I'm kind of less a believer in them adopting Bitcoin, um, but at least they don't stop it. They don't uh, illegalize it. So it's still legal. Businesses can accept it, no problem, but it's not supported by the government in any way. Okay. And back home, how do you see? Uh, in Slovakia, well, Europe in general, it's not very friendly towards Bitcoin. You know, they're going against custodial uh let's say self custody wallet uh they want to make sure they know where your bitcoin is moving and mm -hmm. you know it's it's very against privacy it goes against anonymity and uh the mining is being kind of pushed out as well they they are canceling in germany the nuclear power plants so mm -hmm. europe is doing weird stuff uh, or European Union in general. So I don't see at this current um, time period that Bitcoin will be very well adopted in European countries. There are some exceptions, very yeah, small Lugano. exceptions, like maybe Lugano in Switzerland, of course. In Norway, there's some Bitcoin mining happening. But in general, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners are getting out of the country more to Central America or South America because that's where the Bitcoin is really taking traction and that's where you really feel more freedom. Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I, actually, uh, it's, it's quite similar here uh, in Spain. They want to track you where your Bitcoin and so on. So, so yeah, I, I get that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, man, we're going to start wrap it up. So maybe I'm going to uh, ask you to, one or two more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, uh, one of, the, one of the main questions is that, uh, what advice do you give to other educators? Basically, that's, that's one question for me as well <laughs> that I want to hear. Yeah. So, uh, to, uh, you already explained a bit, uh, how to onboard, uh, 
you know, like newbies and so on, but how to how we can improve our, our, our path or what can we do better? What what do you see that it's it's misleading or maybe that us the educators we're not doing it that that we can maybe do better? I think the general advice would be focus more on like the interpol interpersonal part of education and being a better educator itself than uh the bitcoin part because we are a lot of educators are great bitcoiners they can explain or they, they can they understand the thing they're already sold into the into the vision and philosophy of bitcoin what i recommend people to practice more is um analogies and simplification because explaining Bitcoin with complicated words doesn't help the newbies, doesn't help the no-pointers. Um, I'm doing for myself uh, like some analogies that, that worked on the classes, how I can explain mining, uh, how, I explain, I, how I can explain nodes and decentralization using analogies with trains, books, dice, um, papers, lottery tickets. So, all these things that we somehow touched in our lives and we understand how it works, connect them to Bitcoin and like simplify and use analogies. That's one thing. And the other would be more understanding where the person comes from, what are their fears, what are the uh, the obstacles, the objections that we spoke about in the beginning. And, and this kind of framework of mindset of being patient, not needing to push Bitcoin into somebody's throat, but just being there, uh, creating content, educating, and, and being receptive when people come. Um, that's, I think, much more valuable. And uh, we can get more people in. So focusing on the grassroots, focusing on like bringing up the education from bottom up, um, that's definitely, I think, the way to go. And that's what's happening in El Salvador right now, because the initial push from top down, I wasn't a big fan of it. Um, luckily, it, it kind of, work that right now me premier is leading the education there um yeah. bitcoiners coming in helping out berlin and salvador is you know it's booming yeah. with Bitcoin businesses so so there are some pretty amazing initiatives but initial i was very skeptical of like you know all this chivo boom everybody needs to accept bitcoin even though i'm a bitcoin lover you know i don't want people to be forced to accept it yeah so as educators we should be kind of also pointing out to this um, things that are not very good for general Bitcoin adoption. Um, we should be listening more, maybe talking less, and 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 kind of trying to get to the mindset of a of a beginner again because it's very hard. Once you're deep down the rabbit hole, and you need to explain that thing for one thousandth time, you start to lose patience. And this is, I think, what us as educators we need more patience. There's going to be new and new people jumping in, every price increase, new class of Bitcoiners, falling for scams, leaving mm. their, their coins on exchanges, losing their private keys. So we need to have a patience. We need to kind of keep repeating the same thing and again and again and, uh, and become better communicators and listeners. Okay, perfect. I will... I will take notes about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and last and last but not least, uh, anything that you want to add that I didn't uh, ask you, and you think that is important? And where can people find you? So, um, we, people can reach me out on Twitter, uh, Dusan underscore Matuska or M E T H. Um, they can reach out to us. I recommend everybody to come and visit Rotan. It's a beautiful place. It used to be one of the most famous pirate it islands is. and uh, there is still there are still probably two or three pirate treasures on the island from 17th 18th century that haven't been found yet so people sometimes come here and, and try to search for them uh, there is a island that belonged to Henry Morgan the guy on the Captain Morgan rum bottle okay. and uh, that island is here the, the wall built by Henry Morgan is still here so it's it has it really breathed the history and uh, the freedom uh, spirit on Roatan. The people are amazing. If you like to be around water or diving, it's a beautiful reef around here. And we want to make it the Bitcoin island of Caribbean. That's that's our goal here. Already sixty businesses are accepting. So. 
come to our town, for example, in, in February, 5th to 15th of February, we are organizing a Bitcoin experience tour, which is a trip vacation for 12 Bitcoiners um, that want to come and, uh, you know, meet the community, visit businesses, have great vacation, be around water. Um, so we're right now filling up the spaces. So if somebody's interested, go can go to meth.com slash tours and you can you can subscribe you can uh, book your book your spot so that's a great way to explore Roatan. perfect man and i uh as usual i will add everything in the podcast notes so you can find it really quick really super easy <laughs> and super. Awesome. thank you for being here thank you for your time thank you for sharing your experience in, in honduras and I wish you the best of luck in your challenge. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good <laughs> one. So hopefully I will have you um, in the, in near futures. And so you can tell me more about it. <laughs> I would love to. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Man. And guys, see you on the next one. Ciao.